Good afternoon. Today is not only the last day of our most recent uh, sermon series or service series, it is also the last day of the church year. Uh, beginning in Advent, where we focus on the coming of our Savior Jesus, the church year closes on a similar note. We focus on the coming of our Savior again. And today in the Word, the Spirit reminds us to stay ready, to stay focused, to keep our eyes to the skies. Uh, our worship begins with our first hymn. The hymn is, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending. God bless your worship.
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And so in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help Save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God and Savior, you have set the final day and hour when we shall be delivered from this world of sin and death. Keep us ever watchful for the coming of your Son, 
that we may sit with him and all your holy ones at the marriage feast in heaven, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture lesson is from Isaiah chapter 51, and it also serves as the basis for the sermon today. And in this prophecy of Isaiah, where the Lord speaks, he is encouraging his people to remember his faithfulness to them in the past, how he keeps his promises, and to live confident of his deliverance, which is just another word of, for salvation, live confident of his salvation, his deliverance in the future. We read beginning in verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 51. Listen to me, you peoples who pursue righteousness, you people who seek the Lord. Look confidently to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were cut. Look confidently to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who gave you birth. Yes, when I called him, Abraham was only one person, but I blessed him and multiplied him. The Lord is certain to comfort Zion. He will comfort all her ruins Certainly he will make her wilderness like Eden and her wasteland like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the sound of music. Pay attention to me, O my people. My nation, listen to me. For the law will go out from me and I will establish my justice as a light to the peoples. My righteousness is near. My salvation goes forth and my arms will bring justice to the peoples. The sea coasts will wait for me. They will have confidence in my arm. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look closely at the earth beneath, because the heavens will vanish like smoke, and the earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants will die like gnats. But my salvation will remain forever, and my righteousness will never be abolished. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm of the day is Psalm 98. We join to read it responsibly. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known. He has revealed his righteousness to the eyes of the nations. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Break out in joyful song. Make music, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with fairness. The word of the Lord. Our second scripture reading is from Jude chapter, excuse me, verse, verses 20 to 25, where Jesus, struggling with this one, where Jude, Jude explains how we live in anticipation of Jesus' return, how we do things that build up our faith and we show mercy to our neighbor. Jude writes, But you, dear friends, Continue to build yourselves up in your most holy faith as you keep praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you continue to wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, which results in eternal life. Show mercy to those who are wavering. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. Show mercy to still others with fear, hating even the clothing that is stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless in the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all time, now, and to all eternity. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel. Alleluia, alleluia. 
The Lord is not slow to do what he promised, as some consider slowness. Instead, he is patient for your sakes, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. Alleluia. The gospel is from Mark chapter 13, where Jesus says what is a common refrain in the gospel is that he will come again, but that we do not know and will not know when he will return. And so, therefore, we ought to keep watch. We ought to do what the point of our service is today. Live with our eyes on the prize. Live with our eyes directed at the skies. We read beginning at verse 26. Jesus says, Then you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with great power and glory. At that time he will send out his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of the sky. Learn from this illustration of the fig tree. Whenever its branches become tender and sprout leaves, you know that the summer is near. So also, when you see these things happening, you will know that he is near at the doors. Amen, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things happen. I should pause and explain for just a moment. That word that is translated there, generation, it can refer specifically to a generation like we typically talk about, millennials. It can also refer to a type of people uh, in the Greek. So don't think that Jesus was saying, oh, you don't know, or, or that he would come right away. He's, he's not saying that, although he says, be, be ready. Anyway, reading on. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Watch, be alert, and pray, because you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going away on a journey. When he left his home, he put his servants in charge and assigned what each one was to do. He also commanded the doorkeeper to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house is coming, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or early in the morning. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. But I say to you, I say to everyone, keep watch. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated as we join to sing the hymn of the day. The day is surely drawing near.
Grace and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I am easily distracted. Like even on a surface level, I get very easily distracted. I can't hear noises and focus. Uh, So if you stop by church and my office door is shut or mostly shut, please don't think that I'm somehow trying to be antisocial, that I don't want to talk to my people. I really don't want to be antisocial. I do want to talk to my people. But just hearing other noises or doors opening or children talking or people walking down halls can really just throw my, my attention if I'm trying to focus on something in particular. But it's more than just that. Um, I'm also easily distracted in other ways. Emotionally. Spiritually. Like it's easy for me, it's very easy for me to fixate on the fleeting. And to be deeply affected by the, the fleeting. And while sometimes I think I'm pretty special, uh, I think the better part of wisdom says that I'm not as special as I think. And that I'm not alone on that. In fact, I think that's why it's so easy for all of us when things are going well in life to feel like, yeah, everything is well, all is well with the world. But when one particular thing throws us for a curveball, all that can go out the window in a heartbeat and it feels like nothing is okay and and everything is overwhelming. That's because we're easily distracted. It's because we let the things of this world instead of the things that are eternal become the most important things. It's because we lose our focus so easily. So the word of God that's before us today is meant to be an encouragement to God's people to not lose their focus. Originally addressed to Jewish exiles in Babylon whose homeland had been overrun and destroyed by foreign armies and who very likely felt very little reason for for joy of any kind because that destruction had been a direct consequence of their own rebellion, God, through Isaiah, was here focusing his people on on his goodness and his hope. He was refocusing them by reminding them, first of all, of their past. He, He pointed them back to their nation's founding family. Remember that story? I'm sure you've all heard it before. How God called one man by the name of Abraham to leave his homeland to leave his people, to go to a land how, that, that he would show him, and how God promised to make that one man into many men, into a great nation. And eventually he said, I'll bless the whole world through you. Yet, though Abraham obeyed and he went, that didn't seem to work out, at least in Abraham's mind, like he had expected. Sarah, his wife, was barren, so pretty hard to make a great nation from you and your barren wife. And the two of them eventually grew so old that when God again told them this this promise that they would have a child and, and that's how they would have that promise fulfilled, Sarah laughed. But of course, God kept that promise. Abraham did become a great nation. When the time was right, which was when Abraham was about 100, and Sarah, his wife, or he was 100, and Sarah, his wife, was about 90. They had a child by the name of Isaac. And then in time, Isaac had two children of his own. And then one of those children, Jacob, had 12 sons. And those sons would become so prosperous and so many that they would eventually number in the millions as they came out of Egypt. And so God, to his exiled people in Babylon, is saying through Isaiah, remember that. Remember 
that though it seems impossible and though you may not seem to be worthy, you may not feel worthy, I will keep my promises to you. So then what were the promises that God made to those people, to those exiles in Babylon? Well, in a way they were, they were twofold. First, there was an assurance to those exiles in Babylon that God would bring them out of Babylon, that God would allow those exiles to go back to their homeland and rebuild their, their ruined cities and especially the city of God, Jerusalem, and, and his temple. And in fact, just a few chapters earlier, God had even name-checked the Persian king through whom God would keep that promise, even though that king, by the name of Cyrus, had not yet been born. But that wasn't all there was to God's promises here in Isaiah chapter 51, or the rest of the book that bears the prophet's name, for that matter. Throughout the prophecy of Isaiah, there's also a running undercurrent of a deeper and more lasting restoration of God's people. A, a, a promise of a deeper and a greater deliverance on which God's people could place their hopes. And the words here in Isaiah chapter 51 are no exception to that. Because Jerusalem, when God makes promises about Jerusalem here in Isaiah chapter 51, we need to realize that Jerusalem doesn't just refer to a physical city, but it also, in the Bible, is a reference to the place where God dwells with his people. And the law of God, the Hebrew Torah, it doesn't merely refer to commandment laws, or even to the first five books of the Bible, like modern Jews refer to the Torah. The, the word Torah refers in general to the teaching of God's, of God's word. And the justice that God referred to in Isaiah chapter 51, justice that God would establish, could not refer only to punishment for evildoers, or it would not have served, as Isaiah here says, as a light to the people. Which, in other words, was a light to, to the unbelieving nations. Now, through Isaiah, God was here encouraging his exiled people, and you and me as well, to have confidence in the deliverance, in the salvation that God would eventually establish and through which he would eventually bless the entire world, the salvation and the deliverance that has come through Christ and that would eventually be realized in all of its fullness on the day Jesus comes again. And so as this was an encouragement to Old Testament Jewish exiles to not become distracted with their temporary situation or despair of their hope of deliverance, it is perhaps even more of an encouragement for you today. Because you see, not only are you the recipients of these promises as the Jewish exiles living 2,500 years ago were, but you are also a witness to the fulfillment of these promises. Just think about this. In Isaiah's day, the people of God were more or less limited to one relatively tiny ethnic group. Only Israel knew of God's promises in the world. And only Israel, and not even that many of them, actually put their hope in the deliverance or the salvation of the true God. But God promised in Isaiah 51 that the distant coastlines would hear of these things, and so it is. The righteousness of God that, through Isaiah, God said 2,500 years ago, well, 2,700 years ago, that he said was near, the righteousness of God that was near this righteousness of God has now been made known, not just to a tiny ethnic group Israel, but to all the world. The distant coastlines of the world have now heard of the justice of God, which is to say his just verdict of condemnation 
upon sin, but salvation for the sinner all in Christ. And so the Torah, which is to say the teaching of God, it has spread from Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the world. And so in other words, the promises of Isaiah chapter 51 have been at least partially fulfilled. And so have the promises of Isaiah chapter 7 and the promises of Isaiah chapter 9 and the promises of Isaiah chapter 49 and the promises of Isaiah chapter 53. The virgin was with child and she gave birth to a son and we call him Emmanuel. Isaiah chapter 7. To us, a child was born. To us, a son was given. And the government has been placed upon his shoulders. And he is called Mighty God. Isaiah chapter 9. And it was too small of a thing for him to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel that God had kept. Isaiah chapter 49. No, he would carry our sorrows too. Though we are Gentiles, he would be pierced for our transgressions too and crushed for our iniquities too. The punishment that would bring peace to the whole world would be upon him and by his wounds we too have been healed. Isaiah 53. And so the point is this, that if God has kept those promises, he is going to keep the rest. He is going to keep his word. So let's not get distracted and lose our focus. Let's not let the goals of happy children or good investments our career success, or fleeting pleasure become the highest goals in our life. And let's not allow the worries of this life and the daily stress of this world to dampen our joy or steal our hope. Because the heavens are going to vanish like smoke. And the earth is going to wear out like a garment. And the inhabitants of this world are going to die like gnats. But God's salvation will remain forever. And his righteousness will never be abolished. <clears throat> and so, yes, we need to take this as a warning to our sinful natures. Our time is fleeting. So don't be like a gnat. Or as some translations put this phrase, maybe you remember from the, from the NIV, a fly. Don't be like a fly. Don't confuse the brilliant but artificial lights of this world for the for the one true light of God's glory in paradise. Because if you do, you're going to spend your days like a fly, frantically buzzing around those fake lights, never quite getting the satisfaction that it seems like they should be giving you, and eventually falling to the ground exhausted to die. We should take this as a warning. Yet we should also take the fact that our time in this world is fleeting as a tremendous encouragement, too. Because even though it's really backwards to the normal way that our culture looks at things, and probably the way that we tend to look at things, too, this is not a bad thing. As hard as that is, or weird as that is to hear, it's not a bad thing that our time here is fleeting. The fact that we get to soon put off the tent of these bodies, that tent that, that gets ripped and beaten up so easily by the sun. These tents that are so frail and, and so prone to loneliness and weakness and, and so beaten up by empty promises and disappointments. The fact that we leave all this behind, this is a blessed thing. That doesn't mean that life isn't worth living here. Life is worth living here. The gift of the gift of Life and family, the joy of friendship, the good of work as we pray, and the gift of rest. These are, these are wonderful things. They are, but they're only shadows. 
They're only shadows of the good things that God intended when he first made this place. They're inflicted by sin from the very beginning. And as we, as we age, they, they fade one by one, and eventually they all are taken away. Here we have no enduring city. But that's okay, because we look forward to the city that is to come. To the city that isn't built by human hands. We look forward to a new heavens. We look forward to a new earth where, where we and everything else will be right and righteous and joyful. We look forward to the everlasting deliverance of our God that will never fade. And that's the last little bit of good news I want you to take away with you this afternoon. Your enemies, Satan and your own sinful nature and, and this world, they would always have you believe that there is nothing more important than the things that fill your calendar and scream for your attention every day. But we know better. And the Spirit has filled our hearts enough for us to recognize that whether those daily tasks, those daily duties are met or not, there's always going to be a new one to take their place or 10 new ones to take their place tomorrow, right? Our, our kids experience success only to have a new hurdle to overcome the next day. We achieve a long-term goal only to realize that we've got 18 more long-term goals that we really better get working on. Our, our, our team wins the championship, wins the Super Bowl, and then they disappoint us like like, oh, we can't believe the very next year. But brothers and sisters, what God here says is that there's a day coming that, that we're going to enter Zion, we're going to enter the presence of God with singing and everlasting joy. We'll crown our heads. Gladness and joy, the prophet says, will overtake us. And sorrow and sighing will flee forever. So brothers and sisters, focus on forever. By the grace of Jesus, with the help of the Spirit, focus on forever. Amen. Please stand. Let's join together and confess our faith. We use the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. On Wednesdays, we don't typically gather an offering. Instead, the offering plate is uh, in the rear of the sanctuary. You can deposit your offering there along with your care card as you uh, exit the church after the service. Uh, we continue our worship by singing Rejoice, Rejoice, Believers, hymn 493.
Gracious and eternal Father, today we end another year of grace. Once again, the Holy Spirit has nourished and strengthened our faith as we reviewed the words and works of Jesus recorded in the Gospels. We rejoice to hear that you kept the promises you made to your ancient people. We're encouraged as we remembered how you empower your followers to proclaim the good news in their world. Work in us every day to believe the truths of your word and apply them in our lives. We are aware that we live in dangerous times as Satan and his forces of evil assault your people again and again. Give us wisdom to discern teachings that subtly deny the scriptures. Provide courage to stand against the attacks of godless opponents. Strengthen our resolve to confess the truth and then speak the truth in love. Work in us every day to be watchful and cautious as we live in our world. Help us to take to heart that your Son, our Lord Jesus, is coming again to judge the living and the dead. Since the day of his return is unknown to us, lead us to note the signs that signal the end of time. Spare us from fear as trouble and woe increase, and fill us with hope as we long for that great day. Work in us every day to be ready for the moment of his coming. Fill us with concern for family members and friends who are not taking seriously their need for Jesus and his forgiveness. Provide opportunities, obvious opportunities, to reach out to them with patient persistence and lovingly lead them to your word and sacraments. Make us generous with our offerings so that others can go in our place to proclaim the good news. Work in us every day to witness to Christ and his love for sinners. Lead us to see our Savior's face in the faces of the poor and hungry, the lonely and forgotten, the oppressed and imprisoned, and move us to support them whenever we can. Empower our faith to be lights in the world so that people may see our good works and glorify you and your Son. Work in us every day to imitate your love for the lost, the least, and the last. If you call us to glory before the final day comes, carry our souls to heaven, where we will await the resurrection of our bodies. Comfort those who may grieve over losing us and point them to the day when they will join us at the marriage feast of the Lamb. Work in us every day so that we are ready whenever you call us home. Hear us, Lord, as we also pray in silence. Fill us with hope and joy as we await your Son's return. Cause us to enjoy your earthly blessings in light of your eternal glories and to realize that heaven is really our home. Lead us to long for the splendor of paradise where you will wipe away all tears from our eyes. Work in us every day as we listen for the sound of the final trumpet. Amen. And now, Lord, hear us for Jesus' sake, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for our final song. Our final song is a song I recently discovered, and it fits perfectly for what we're talking about today. The song is called, On That Day... It's about the day when Jesus will return. I believe in Christ, risen from the dead. He now 
reigns victorious, his kingdom knows no end. Through his resurrection, death has lost its hold. I know on that final day, I'll rise as Jesus rose. On that day, we'll see you shining brighter than the sun. On that day, we will know you as we lift our voices one. Till that day, we will praise you for your never-ending grace. And we will keep on singing on that glorious day. What a blessed home. afternoon again. Awesome to be here in God's house with you. Um, there's a lot of announcements. Um, the, the, maybe the main one I want to highlight for you is that, remember, uh, Thanksgiving worship is not on Thursday this week. It's on Wednesday evening. It's at 6.30, not 6 o'clock. Our Advent worship will begin the whole 6 o'clock thing, but Thanksgiving worship is Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. So if, you, if you're going to be around, uh, we hope to, uh, to give thanks to God for all of his blessings to us. I also want to let you know that there's a, a time change for the voters' call meeting next Sunday. Uh, it was going to be held after the second service, but there's a, a wreath 
uh, making event after the second service, um, and there's no Bible study uh, on that day anyway, so we're going to move that call uh, meeting to between services on Sunday, um, on Sunday, December 1st. Other than that, um, please just look through the announcements, and uh, God be with you till we meet again. Have a great week in the Lord, and if you're going out hunting this weekend, uh, stay safe and hope you get something.